um, we'll just let you get comfortable. And we've had some great voting, and I see some of these questions that have risen to the top. So as soon as we can pass, I think we're going to go right to the top, which likely this would be for Pete. Pete, if you want to grab a microphone, the first question is, prior to the purchase of the mountains, was Sir Blackcomb announced the Renaissance Project? What is the status of this initiative? OK. Can, is this working? There we go. Yeah. OK. okay. Uh, so when we announced our capital project for the past year, a year ago, uh, that kind of gave us the opportunity to reframe the renaissance a little bit. And so what we said was our focus was going to be on improving the on-mountain experience. And we were going to prioritize that over uh, base area developments, water park, things like that. Uh, I would tell you right now our, our philosophy hasn't really changed. So our primary focus is going to be to continue to improve the on-mountain experience. Uh, our company is really not in the real estate development business anymore like it was 10, 20 years ago. Um, so I know there are some uh, real estate development opportunities at the base of Blackcomb and at base two, and uh, doesn't mean those wouldn't get done, but it would require um, somebody else, a developer, to come in and um, uh, uh, propose something. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't go forward with anything without the support of the community, uh, without the partnership with the RMOW, and all the things that are in place. So again, not our top priority, not to say it wouldn't happen, but um, uh, that's probably the status of it right now. Mm. Great, thank you very much. Um, glad you turned that mic because the next like 40 questions are for you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make this sort of two-part because it is all about um, transportation. So you can see that too. Is there any discussion plan for expanded highway with, in Whistler and maybe within that context too, given the growth expected, what are the prospects for improved mass rapid transit within both Whistler and the corridor? Uh, okay, so... I'll answer those in reverse order. So I did speak earlier to the idea of a regional transit. So that would be BC Transit, which is the transit provider here in the community. And uh, a lot of work has been done, and we're hoping to have a system in place, as I mentioned, uh, that would run from Mount Curry to Vancouver. So that, I think I would call mass transit. Uh, there are no plans. People had looked into trains and other things, but they are exorbitantly expensive. And when you think about running a uh, uh, tra uh, Vancouver Millennium Line or something of that nature, I think it was like $7 billion from Broadway and Granville TBC. So if you put that in from Vancouver to Whistler, uh, it's pretty cost prohibitive. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one around the highway, uh, is there expanded highway within Whistler? We had been tr working with the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure on that and uh, had a study that was, was undertaken a couple of years ago. But to be honest, there hasn't been a whole lot of up uptake with them. Uh, again, it's, it's a monetary thing. And when we go to the province, uh, it, because it's a provincial highway, they look at you know the lower mainland, uh, Victoria, in terms of how the uh, relevant uh, congestion is in those towns and or those cities and the amount of people they move so we're we weren't super high to be really frank on their list in terms of expanding the highway between say the village and function so those are two transit ones the next one yes yeah, so hang on to that um, okay. who is lobbying on behalf of Whistler to make sure that the foreign buyer tax is not implemented here uh, I think everyone in this room who's a real estate <laughs> agent uh, probably would be the first group. Uh, you know, we certainly let the province know that uh, we were not, or we were, we were pleased with them and not singling Whistler out for the foreign buyer's tax. And I have not heard any mention of expanding that beyond the areas that they've already identified. So hopefully that continues. Okay, I'm going to mix it up a little bit, and I will throw this other one to Pete, but I'm, we'll, we'll make sure we involve some of the other panelists. Um, Pete, we're going to throw this one. Vale is down $4 billion in value in the past quarter, and a dollar earned here is only $0.70 cents to a U.S. company. Is there risk of less investment here in Canada? No, there's no risk, uh, and we did. If you looked at the market yesterday, our stock took a good jump yesterday, so we probably picked up an, about three to $400 million back of that, so it's not quite as bad as it says there. <laughs> uh, 
it's been a, you know, the, the U.S. stock market is extremely volatile right now, so we're susceptible to a lot of what's going on in the larger market. Uh, that said, we haven't met expectations in our last couple announcements, so uh, not by much. But what our, um, you know, what our view of it right now is that our, our stock was at a probably um, unrealistic level when it was trading at about $300, uh, which it was uh, in the fall. Uh, not, it really was probably not where it should have been. And so with the recent announcements, uh, first in December at our annual earnings, um, and then uh, the, me the metrics that we announced kind of post-holiday um, each year, which we, both of those announcements were not bad. They were just slightly under expectations. And, and when you're trading at a, at a premium like we were, little tiny bits of bad news like that will, will force your stock to take a hit. So all that said, you know, it's explainable. We don't love it uh, uh, that the market penalizes us so much. Uh, but what I would say is our company is really focused on significant investment in, you know, what we would say are our destination or premium resorts. And those would include Whistler Blackcomb, Vail, Beaver Creek, Breckenridge, and Park City. So those resorts will always see more of the investment because the business case for those investments is much stronger than it is at our smaller resorts. So I feel really optimistic about future investment at Whistler Blackcomb. As I said, we're going to pause for this year. We, we're still investing, but not at the level that we have. And we're going to come forward with another uh, list of projects, impactful projects, a year from now. And I would see 2020 and 2021 would be uh, significant investments again. Maybe not 66 million, but still uh, pretty, pretty substantial investments. All right, thank you very much. Um, this one will be for uh, Carrie or Maxine. What are the development plans of the land in Lower Cadenwood by the Lilwatt Nation? Um, you know, very similar in sort of style to what already exists um, in the upper Cadenwood neighborhood. I'd say slightly less lower scale. It's really almost more of an upper upper Bay Shores than a lower lower Cadenwood in terms of its location. Um, but you know, I think a mix of sort of market housing, um, luxury single family home, and and townhome development uh, within sort of the bed units that are allocated in in Whistler's updated official community plan for the property. Thanks, and now I'm going to th take this one to Meredith. Uh, what do you think the impact on occupancy rates are by Airbnb, and do we have the ability to measure bookings and the economic impact they might be having? Um, so to measure Airbnb is a bit difficult uh, because, or any of the owner direct sites, Airbnb is not the only one, uh, because it, we would require every individual owner to report to us the same way that the hotels do. Um, but there are some scraping sites out there. So we use a company called AirDNA. If you're an individual property owner, you can purchase the reports for yourself um, as well. Um, so it scrapes. Uh, listings on Airbnb and then as they're removed because they've been booked it kind of makes an estimate at occupancy uh, so we use that as our sort of best guess for volume of the market um, and performance and it generally performs similar to um, our, our hotels and uh, property managed condos um, so that's sort of our best way of measuring it right now in terms of economic impact I mean if we just want to look at how many room nights there are in Whistler that the graph that I showed at the beginning, which was over 1.3 million room nights this last season, winter and summer season. Um, when we do our calculations, um, we have 70% of zoned nightly rental accommodation reporting to us and then we extrapolate for the remainder, assuming that they're performing in a similar way as the rest. Um, so we're already sort of measuring the impact in terms of how many room nights they're generating when we, met, when we report our room night numbers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna jump over to Mike and I'll inevitably be jumping back to Pete. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna throw this one at you, Mike. I'm loving this. Uh, why wouldn't the Muni, in quotation marks, release the hounds and develop all the available, is that like an actual construction term? I need to ask, but anyway. <laughs> and develop all the available land around Chequemus. Why only baby steps in developing the smaller parcel? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, we no longer have any housing reserves, meaning we don't have any cash to put into housing development. So in order to uh, develop employee housing, we have to borrow the money. And well, we, first of all, we have to come up with some capital. 
uh, uh, some equity to start up, but where the primary source will be from borrowing. And when you borrow money, you have to be confident to be able to repay it. And our main source of repaying it would be through uh, uh, rental revenue. So there is a certain comfort level of the municipality on how much debt we want to get into and how much we want to uh, rely on rental revenue to pay off that debt. And I think those in the real estate market, things always work until they don't. And when they don't, uh, we don't want to find ourselves with an uh, unbearable debt load that would have to be serviced by the people in this room and the other taxpayers in the municipality. So yes, we are going to proceed with some caution and uh, we're playing with your dollars. So we want to be careful that any debt that we are going to be servicing in the future, uh, we feel confident that we can do it, knowing that we live in, and work in a very cyclical economy. Great, okay, and uh, I'm gonna throw this one over to Pete. It's been sitting there at the top for a bit. Um, can, Pete can Pete explain why there appears to be a significant and widely accepted, in brackets, by our guests, drop in service levels and attitude from on-mountain employees? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that in a, a, a couple different ways. Uh, first of all is we're feeling the same effects that I think everybody else in town is. Uh, it's been re referenced several times in the presentations today around this uh, you know, labor shortage. Uh, we are absolutely uh, finding it difficult to uh, maintain the service levels that we would like in certain areas. We try to be really strategic. Uh, when we are short-staffed on any given day about uh, what's open, what's closed. Uh, if you're up at the roundhouse, you'll notice uh, we don't have all the outlets open. We haven't had all the outlets open once yet this year. That's a decision by us on let's make it, try to make it good where we've got it and make some of those tough decisions elsewhere. So uh, not unusual. I would also add that uh, we survey our guests. Uh, we do get a lot of feedback and uh, counter to what it says there, our uh, guest satisfaction scores for employees specifically are actually up over prior year. So on any given day, yeah, you can go out and you can find a grumpy employee and that can be your impression of what our staff is like. But when we look at the totality of the season and what we've seen so far over th literally thousands of surveys, uh, we actually feel pretty good about the service level overall. Great, thank you. Um, just to mix it up a bit here, I'm going to ask, uh, this is directed to Meredith and, and the whole panel, anyone who wants to weigh in on this. How do you see festivals and events evolving to remain relevant and interesting in the future? We, yep, do you want to go first? <laughs> oh, well, you can. It should be on first. Um, so. My Fury's looking at me as I chair the uh, FENA Oversight Committee. Um, the festival and events is constantly under review and we're really looking at now um, how this is going to evolve for the future. So it's certainly top of mind, I think, for the people that are involved in, in the festival and, and events. We do have great um, economic impact studies on almost all of the major festivals that happen in the resort, so there's good indication there. And um, from the municipality's point of view, we are we invest in um, that sort of in uh, a lot of these festivals with, that are put on by third party um, operators. So you know everything has a life and a life cycle, and I think at the planning. Um, position which we are in right now is really looking at what's the next big thing and where should we be focusing for festivals and events. I was, I was just going to say that um, I agree with everything that you say Sue um, and that we definitely need to keep pursuing sort of a balanced portfolio of events so having some of the big names um, that come from out of town aren't, aren't necessarily a bad thing um, they bring great exposure for, for Whistler. Um, and then on the other side of that, I think we also still need to focus on sort of the homegrown events. So something like Crankworks has grown to be this huge festival that's um, all over the world now, but started in Whistler. Um, so if we can kind of find more opportunities like that, I think that will continue to maintain sort of unique festivals and events that have that real Whistler feel to them, which is what our customers are looking for. Thank you. All right, and I'm going to have you hang on to that and Mike join in and we're just going to ask this one of you. I think it'll be interesting for folks to understand it. 
For Mike and Meredith, what are plans for the increased revenue from MRDT, essentially the local hotel tax, with rates up to 3% and nightly operators now collecting remitting? What will happen with those funds? <laughs> Just me? It says your name first. I'll give, <laughs> I'll give you the microphone just in case. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we, the, I mean, I guess this is directed to both of us because Tourism Whistler and the RMOW um, split the MRDT taxes. Uh, ours go into marketing, and as I mentioned, a lot of our marketing funds are totally directed to off-peak um, periods now, so that will continue to be the plan for Tourism Whistler for off-peak periods and working with our members to develop experiences in those times for our visitors. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, I guess the other part I would say uh, how we're using the new funds or, or planning to, we have uh, managed to get the province to agree for the funds to be used uh, by the municipalities to support our like village operations, uh, which are in the three to four million dollar range. So that allows us to uh, balance our property taxes and, and they do increase from time to time, but sort of using that money to really uh, respond to and run the sort of tourism part of the municipality's operating costs. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I think we'll, it's, we're hitting uh, 511 here, so let's take one more. And I know everybody does get pretty excited about expansion. So I'm going to throw this last one over to Pete. And it's uh, Whistler Blackcomb has recently made a significant investment in lifts. Are there future plans for the expansion of the ski area terrain to the south end of the valley? Yeah, so we get this question asked uh, quite a bit. And, you know, it comes up in the context of the mountain feels busy. We know the, the visitation numbers are quite high, and wouldn't the best solution be to... Um, develop more terrain. So sounds easy, uh, but it is a it's a massive undertaking. So as as you probably know, there there's really no expansion opportunity on Blackcomb. There is expansion opportunity on Whistler uh, via our master plan, and so it's something that is it's out there in the future. I would tell you uh, our our probably short term focus on some more significant developments might be more in the on mountain restaurant. Uh, the dining scene, despite what I just said around our staffing challenges, uh, we still see the opportunity to um, increase seating, especially on the Whistler side. Uh, one of the benefits of, of being able to compare across all our resorts is we have metrics on uh, pr pretty much every aspect of the guest experience you can imagine. So one of the, one of the things that we look at is skier visits per seat, restaurant seat. And through that, we've realized Whistler Blackcomb is actually the, the most underseated of our large destination resorts. Um, and so there's a wide view in our company among, this is an area that we feel like we can tackle. We hear it a lot from our guests, and it's something that we, we want to do. So uh, to answer that question, it's out there. We'll get to that point someday. It is not in the immediate future, and I think there are some other wins that we can have along the way uh, between now and then. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Pat to wrap it up. I just wanted to share two things. One, when we go into the reception, some of these questions, take them up with the folks that have been here presenting or amongst yourselves. There's lots of various uh, expertise and interest groups in the room. Uh, but I wanted to share one comment, just a comment that was shared to Maxine and Carrie. Uh, from Anonymous, they may, they may actually come up to you and say who they are after this. But just nice to see this note. Super excited to see the nation celebrating the past and embracing a new future. And that sums up a lot of what's been going on in this country. You guys are at the center of it. We're standing by as partners, and good things just keep happening. And it is indeed a really exciting new age we're entering into. So that was absolutely worth mentioning. Uh, with that, I'm going to leave it over to Pat to close. Thank you, everybody, for playing along with Slido.